Hello, it's Hooded Kobold, and welcome back to part 7 of our GM's Guide to the Ghosts of Saltmarsh. In this one, we're going to be focused on the Isle of the Abbey. The Isle of the Abbey was originally written by Randy Maxwell and published in 1992. It was in issue 34 of the Dungeon Magazine. So the adventure here is there is an island that has a bunch of cultists on it that kind of shared it with some pirates, and that recently has uh, led to a fallout. So, why was the Abbey burned down? Well, the background to the Isle of the Abbey is that there originally was cultists and pirates who were using the island. The pirates would go around the area doing their pirating thing, and then come back there and use the clerics of the island as their fence. Now, the clerics, being evil and all, were not making fair deals. These deals were definitely in the favor of the clerics, so... Eventually, the pirates just kind of got fed up with that. Once the pirates had the numbers, they attacked the island, killing everyone they could and burning everything to the ground. The book provides three hooks to kind of get the players into this part of the module. The first one is Gilded Rumors. This is where there's an island, the Isle of the Abbey, that has these evil clerics on it. Now, these evil clerics have the island guarded, so if it's guarded, there must be something valuable they're guarding. So that is the draw, is to get the adventurers to go to the island and seek out the treasures that are within this abbey. The second hook is for the good-natured party. This is for the people. And this is where the Mariner's Guild is asking the players to go clear off this island, the Isle of the Abbey, so that a lighthouse can be constructed there. There have been a high number of accidents that were caused because boats can't see these sand dunes, and they don't know how to navigate these dangerous waters, and if there was a lighthouse there, it would allow them to not crash as often. The third hook is the Salt Marsh tie-in. This is where Eleander Fireborn is sponsoring this expedition to the Abbey. He hopes to put a base there. This is because hopefully by now, within your overarching campaign, the Scarlet Brotherhood has become a menace. In my last video, Salvage Operation, which you can find up here, this is where I open up, hopefully, that can of worms of how the Scarlet Brotherhood is really invading the town and starting to try to take things over. So now the council is really going to fight back and try to do what they can to stop the Scarlet Brotherhood. No matter which hook you chose, the Mariner's Guild or the council is going to have the players go reach out to Major Ursa. Major Ursa is part of the Mariner's Guild and has good insight on the Isle of the Abbey. For instance, he knows that the island can only be accessed in one area known as Skull Dunes. This is called that because there are a plethora of undead that have now taken over that area and kind of guard it. And since it's the only entrance into the plateau of the island, uh, no one can reach that area. Major Ursa can also be like those old school fortune tellers. And if the characters have any questions or run into any issues and they don't know how to proceed, they can always fall back on Major Ursa and ask him for anything that he might know and you can kind of use him as a way to kind of guide the players for the different avenues how they can solve this module. So hopefully our players have now made it to the Skull Dunes and this is where the first little part that I think needs some work done to it. So as it's written there is a pirate's path. There's an area that they're supposed to take and this is where the pirates have been navigating so that they don't have to deal with the undead. The book does provide some rules. There's a perception check that's made, and based on that check, they're allowed to move that many spaces. The first problem I see with this is that there are only 21 spaces. So if the players just get a 10 and an 11, they'll only have one encounter, making this kind of a moot point. But showing the rest of the rules, when they do run into a square that contains a number, that many skeletons will attack the party. And this initiates phase one. Once the party has slain 20 skeletons, they enter phase two. And phase two, all the skeletons within two squares of the square the player's in activate. But they're only attacked by three skeletal swarms and a skeleton juggernaut. The juggernaut is kind of cool as it slowly dies, dropping its parts and bones. And when it finally dies, it actually completely falls apart, but actually becomes 12 skeletons that then attacks the party, which is kind of fun. 
There is a table that's provided to add some complications. There can be some manticore that attack or some zombies that go washed ashore. So it does provide a way to make things a little harder. The players also might decide that they don't even want to go with the dunes and they'd like to try to climb. I definitely could see my group doing this as they like to take the most strange routes. So the book does provide rules for it. It says that the walls are 45 feet tall and that when they make an athletics check, the DC is 12, they climb 15 feet each time. So three checks, DC 12 athletics, and they make it to the top. So the drawback to it though, is that when they fall, they take double fall damage. So half of that is normal fall damage. The other half is slashing damage done by the rocks down below. So the skull dunes can be either basically non-existent if the players roll really well, or kind of a slog, like drawn out, boring adventure if they have to keep fighting these zombies. So I propose a way to help fix this. First, the island isn't given a god to worship. It just says that they're evil cultists. So if you look at the model, it doesn't actually give them a patron to worship. So what I recommend doing is to use one of the dead three, the god of death himself, Merkel. And instead of having just a plethora of undead on this beach roaming around and the players have to find this correct path, instead have a red dragon that has been brought back to life, undead dragon now, that flies around guarding the sand dunes. This will provide a much more interesting encounter for your players in my opinion, because it's not just a straight up fight, that's a slug match, that they kind of just have to keep beating back all these skeletons. Instead, there's now this great dangerous thing that they must either avoid or kind of fight off until they can kind of get away and then hopefully run away and hide again. And it provides, in my opinion, a better adventure. Once the players finally make it out of the sand dunes and to the ruins of the abbey, they'll notice that it has been fully burnt down. After some searching though, they'll find piles of what looks like refuse and other things that have been kind of tossed aside that are meant to be thrown away and there's a cellar door nearby. And this leads us to the remaining cultists left on the island. The remaining cultists are Asmodeus, Odium, Bayleaf, Ogmund, and seven other cultists or guards. Ozymandias is a human priest, and since all the other higher ranking members have been slain, is the current leader. He is also the holder of the magic amulet that somewhat controls the undead on the island. Odium was just an unlucky soul who was passing by. He's a businessman who was just wanting to buy and sell goods and was in the wrong place at the wrong time when the pirates attacked the cultists. The next of our survivors is Bayleaf. He is an elf bard. He was hired as an instructor to train the guards for the abbey. He and Odium are not actually cult members, so they aren't wanting to fight, but are willing to defend themselves. Our last named character is Ogmund and he's looking for a fight. Ogman is described as a large oaf with a hothead who was upset that when the pirates attacked, he didn't die in that battle. So he has that Viking rage thing going on. So the book does provide a way for either a hostile or a conversational encounter to happen. Hostile is kind of the easy one where they just duke it out and whoever wins, wins. But the conversational one is kind of interesting. Ozzy doesn't want to surrender the island. He is a devout follower of Merkel and instead offers the characters to join his cult and provide him passage off the island to the mainland. And if they do that, then he lets them live. So if the players are looking for a more peaceful resolution to this, if they are able to quickly slave Ozymandias and Ogmund, then the rest of the people surrender. Looking at the map, rooms 1 through 10 have mostly been converted into living or common areas for the survivors. Room 6, or the meditation room, is a little different though. It states in the room there is a mural of a red dragon eating a sheep. And this is where I think it's a good way to tie in the dragon that guards the sand dunes, make the imagery on both of those descriptions the same. So hopefully the players will mentally tie those two together. Another helpful tie-in is the amulet that Ozymandias has make that a dragon head with a similar description to the mural instead of the geometric shapes like the book provides. This will hopefully tie in that this medallion 
is also what controls the dragon. So if your players do explore the meditation room, they can find a secret room, room 11, that opens up into another wing of the dungeon. This part is called the Winding Way, and it has all these traps and false rooms to kind of thwart anyone who would come down here to collect the treasure that is hidden here. So after the two threats are dealt with that really uh, endanger this island, that being the dragon or skeletons guarding the sand dunes, and then the cultists that are guarding the abbey, the players can return to whoever gave them this quest, whether it be the council or the mariner's guild, to collect the reward. I really like this adventure. There's a lot of ways to solve the different scenarios, and I think by making a couple of those changes to like the sand dunes, that I think is kind of a, a slog, and changing that instead of having Major Ursa be off on some island that's not even on the map, just make him in Saltmarsh, I think this adventure is pretty good. Well, I hope you like this video. All the maps that I created for this will be in the description down below. Also, if you like the content that I create, please feel free to subscribe, as it gets me one step closer to allowing me to do this full time, making it a legitimate career instead of just a hobby. And to those who already have subscribed, thank you. You are helping me achieve my dream of having a career that's focused on tabletop roleplaying. So I can't thank you enough. Well, until next time, guys, have a good one. Bye-bye.